Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. We have a fun set of channelings from Quo today that primarily focus on transformation. As I always say, check out my previous episodes to learn more about Quo. Quo is a group of higher density beings that channel through a group called LL Research. We have covered many of their wonderful channelings and they cover a variety of topics. If it doesn't resonate with you, forget about it. But some of this stuff really resonates with me and I love to share it. We get some discussion of transformation from the original Law of One channelings by Ra. For those of you that don't know, Ra is a portion of Quo. They use Quo, which also includes additional higher density social memory complexes to make it easier to channel in a conscious manner. The original raw channelings were somewhat dangerous because they invited opposition from negative densities and they find it's much safer and easier to channel in this method. And I find it much easier to understand than the original Law of One channelings. We begin with a channeling delivered on January 12th, 2008. Our question this evening, Quo, has to do with the concept of transformation. On our individual journeys of seeking, each of us go through various experiences. And we observe these experiences. And I'm guessing that when we observe them with the most accuracy, we don't have judgment for them. We just go through them and let them experience themselves through our lives. And in some way or another, cumulatively or individually, or at some point, transformations occur. And we would like you to speak to this concept of transformation. How do we come about it? Is there a time within our seeking that is most right for it? Is there a way that we can aid it most effectively? Talk to us about transformation. We are those known to you as the principle of Quo. Greetings in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator in whose service we come to you this day. We thank you, my friends, for asking us to join your circle of seeking at this session of working. It is our honor and our privilege to join you. We are most appreciative of the opportunity to attempt to be of service to the one creator by sharing our humble thoughts with you on the subject of transformation. As always, we would ask that each of you employs his powers of discrimination as each listens to that which we have to say or reads those words which we share at this time. Follow the resonance in those thoughts that appeal to you and seem full of life to you. If those things which we have to say do not happen to have any resonance, then we would ask for you to leave them aside and continue seeking until you find that which resonates to you, for your powers of discrimination are quite adequate to allow you to sense the rightness of those things which you need to take into your process at this time. This applies not only to our words, but to all those things which you hear or read. Let your natural ability to discriminate between that which is for you and that which is not for you function in the way that it should and follow the law of attraction. We thank you for this consideration. It will allow us to speak our thoughts freely without being concerned that we may infringe upon your free will or disturb the rhythmic flow of your process. Transformation is a somewhat overused term among those who seek in the ways of spirit. Both your established religions and your alternative spiritual practices tend to speak of transformation until it has almost become diminished as a word from having been overused. In its roots, my friends, it means to change form, to cross over from one form to another. In a different word with the same root, transformation often allows an intake of information to form new mental and emotional formations thus precipitating the deeper self into the need to accommodate new information. By information, we do not simply mean that which is taken in through the process of reading books, attending seminars, or listening to inspired speakers. We speak of the whole intake process of a working, conscious, awakened spirit in incarnation on planet Earth. 
there's a tremendous amount of information which flows into the five senses and moves through the awareness and thought processes of each entity, all things being grist for the mill. So the transformation is a move from one stage or phase of life to another. It almost has the connotation or the inference of being that of a shapeshifter where you actually change your spiritual or metaphysical shape. There are models of transformation which are helpful in thinking about times of change within the self as it undergoes realizations of accumulated information which have precipitated change. One model is the much cliched butterfly, and there is some advantage to thinking of transformation using this model. The unawakened pupa and larva go about their routines eating and becoming ready to enter into a phase of development that is transformative in a way that changes the form of life, that which crawls to that which flies. And you may see that time of transformation as precipitated by the going into the cocoon of dealing with new thoughts and letting those thoughts marinate within your consciousness. The thoughts and concepts which you have taken in can come from many, many sources, only partially those of the intellect and intellectual activities, such as reading and discussing and pondering inspired thoughts or thoughts that you hope will be inspired. You also are processing the cumulative cycles of your feelings, and you are dealing with the challenges that you are experiencing in all of the various chakras, especially in the first three chakras in terms of those stages leading up to transformation. And when in the natural course of time you spring forth from your cocoon, you are indeed a new creature, looking at life from a slightly different vantage point, higher, broader. Little do you know that you also have become beautiful and are flying from person to person and thought to thought, with life-giving pollen within your touch. You do not even know you are transmitting it, for the pollen of the awakened spirit is that of being rather than doing, and there is little of intellectual nature in how an entity becomes able to be of service to others by the very radiance of his being. However, that model of transformation suggests that first you were unawakened and couldn't fly, and now you are awakened and you can fly. First you were a slug, and now you are beautiful. And such butterfly thoughts will actually get you nowhere. For transformation is a cycle. It is an inevitable cycle. You will transform. You shall become a new creature. The only question is whether or not you wish to accelerate the process of your own spiritual evolution. Those who are listening to these words and those who read them are those who wish to become more than they have been. That wish in and of itself will hasten the rate of speed of change in your life, for by wishing to be transformed and by being willing to be transformed, you make the space of for being transformed. Consequently, we would perhaps rather use the transformational model of the also much cliched chambered nautilus which outgrows his house and therefore enlarges his house without ever leaving his house. Just in such a way do you enlarge your point of view as you move through these cocoon-like periods and emerge from them with the sense of having a new perspective which has created for you the self-perceived feeling of being a new creature. You continue to expand your awareness in a cyclical manner until such time as you pass from this environment through the gates of larger life, where you shall not lose a beat in continuing your spiritual evolution. The rhythm of transformation is linked to several things and we shall look at various of them. Firstly, there is the, shall we say, outer or non-chosen portion of transformation which has to do with your life cycles. There is a natural tendency for each cell in your body to be born, mature, and pass. And there is a natural time for each part of the experience of your incarnation to flourish and then to make way for a different experience based simply upon the accumulation of time and experience in your incarnation. You have little control over this particular part of the cycle of transformation. It is part of your body, part of your mind, part of your emotions, part of the natural phases of life. There is the part of transformation which is involved in very deep and subtle energies, 
such as the stars in your sky, the sun especially, and the moon. The monthly, annual, and slowly revolving astrological pattern of your life will have some sway over the rhythm of your cyclical transformations. And certainly the times that now are upon you, where the fourth density is virtually present, interpenetrating third density, has set you awash in energy tide after energy tide, so that you are constantly being washed with rhythmic waves of truth, love, and understanding. This has the effect upon anyone who is at all sensitive to these energies of creating a more lucid ability to look at the mirroring that is going on in your particular life at this time. Each relationship which you have gives you a mirror for yourself. Just as in your dreams, each character represents a portion of yourself. So, in the waking life, each interaction with another entity shows you the mirror of yourself, in part in the actions and behaviors, the thoughts and the concepts offered by the interaction. Consequently, you are constantly seeing portions of yourself mirrored in a somewhat distorted way by those who are in relationship with you. All of these changes and chances, all of these natural cycles create a basic default. The human was created to transform. That is the nature of the self-conscious, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual being that you are. That is your potential, and that is your destiny. Change from one form into another, from one kind of thought into another whole paradigm of thought. You cannot help but progress, so you may feel easy about whether or not you are changing, whether or not you are being successful at transforming. It is inevitable for you to go through transformation upon transformation, and you do not have to push or thrust yourself towards transformation. You may relax in the knowledge that it is inevitable. Then there is the part of the transformational experience which has completely to do with your will, your hunger, and your thirst for understanding and truth. The more passionate that you are about seeking the truth, the more you are able as a metaphysical entity working in time-space to have an effect upon the pace of your transformative rhythm. It is entirely possible for an entity who is awake and conscious and aware of the process of change to accelerate the pace of that change by quite a bit. The fundamental transformation of a human being within incarnation is from that spiritual childhood of feeling that one is tossed about by outside forces and dependent upon luck and chance for the road is on and the road one may choose to be on to a more mature spiritual awareness in which the entity has taken responsibility for the occurrences and events of everyday life realizing that in those very events lies all the grist needed for the mill of transformation consequently if a seeker wishes to maximize the opportunity for accelerating the rate of spiritual evolution within this refinery of souls, which is third density, the seeker may decide to begin to hone and focus his efforts by the focusing and wetting of his appetite for the truth. The most effective tool in working towards transformation is the self-conscious living of the life. We are not talking about those who mull endlessly over every detail of their life and thought throughout each day, but rather we are talking about the most effective way to work towards transformation. The most effective resource is one's own ability to observe oneself without affecting that which is being observed. The one known as Jim spoke of being aware that in transformation it was important not to judge, and this is the kind of objectivity about which we are speaking. It is indeed important, indeed central, to refrain from judgment as one goes through the collecting of information about the self that is necessary in order for the self to be offered up and thus become empty enough to have the space in which to transform. It is ironic, is it not, that in the search for truth the answers lie not in discovering that which can be known, but in discovering that the secrets to the mystery of transformation lie in unknowing and faith. Faith is the most powerful force in the universe, it being another name for realized or positively realized love. You live in a universe made of love. 
The original thought was a thought of unconditional love. As you transform, the core of your transformation is an awareness that has not been there before about the nature of your central or deepest self as being part of love itself or the creative principle which is the one great original thought of unconditional love. As you become full of new information that brings you to a place of transformation, you suddenly discover that you are no longer full. You discover that this very fullness and sense of new life tips you into the corresponding and balancing awareness of oneself as knowing nothing. It is a devastating portion of transformation, this realization that nothing is known and that nothing can be known within the illusions of the earth world. Yet as one moves through that which has been called the purgative way, one becomes aware that one is utterly empty, and there is a kind of purity in that emptiness that is powerful. You become the holy grail which you seek because you are the cup which is now empty, or that hand outstretched which has nothing in it, ready to receive that which is new, that which comes from the great original thought to transform you as a creature so that you have become that which is new. Then that cycle begins again, where you start from a new place in the spiral of evolution. It is as if it were in a flattened spiral, the same place you have been before in this incarnation. Yet because it is an upward spiral, you are always moving to that place you were before with a new mind, so that you meet the repeating theme or those repeating themes of your incarnation for a new place of observation and experience. These are themes to most entities' incarnations, recurring leitmotifs of the music of your life. For this instrument, for instance, the theme is the study of how to offer love without the expectation of return. It is a powerful lesson in that one learns again and again that one's life is not the life of one who reacts, but one who offers from the creative or generative heart that which is given without any expectation of anything in return. Once one has begun to learn this lesson, one can begin to see how transformed one's life is by the ability to live as a part of the Godhead principle, as one who is willing to let love flow through him. It is one of several very common themes for those who have come to this planet in order to be subject to the Athenor of experience. Each experience which one has becomes a source of possible catalyst. And as one pays more and more attention to one's catalyst, one becomes more and more able to recognize these recurring themes of incarnational level lessons that are part of each entity's life in a unique way. No two entities have the same exact incarnational lessons, for each has chosen those lessons carefully. Consequently, each person, as he transforms and becomes a new person, is offering an energy that has never been offered before in the infinite annals of the creation. For each transformation is from one being to another, equally unique. We thank each for the power and the beauty of the energies which are being run during transformation. The courage of each in being able to go through these dark nights of the soul and to see the magical nature of the self is greatly appreciated by those of us who do not dwell within the veil of unknowing but have access to the truth in a much less veiled way. It may help those seeking to maximize their ability to be transformed and transformational beings to look at the essence of the shaman's experience. The shaman, whatever his nationality or culture, is basically that entity who chooses to go through the death experience while remaining alive. Those of Ra spoke of the shamans of the time of Egypt, who used the pyramid to go down under the pyramid into the catafalk like place where sensations were numbered and an entity was closed up from all incoming experience, thus mimicking the death process. After days spent within the tomb-like place under the pyramid, the experience of death had been well met, and the entity was then able to observe life with a delight and an appetite that would not have been available to the one who had not experienced that death of the senses 
the death of sensation, the death of stimulation, shall we say. The great vigor available to the shaman comes from that entirely organic and spontaneous delight which one who has been dead takes in life after experiencing the deprivation of the dark night of the soul, whether by vision quest or by the steam and the heat of a sweat lodge or by any of those transformative experiences that can be found throughout the various cultures of your planet. There is the completely novel experience of new life, new growth, new hope, and new beingness. With each transformation, there is more of an appreciation for the gift of awareness and an ever more transparent ability to allow things to move through one. One becomes a radiant being not because one has more light within the self, but because one is more able to allow light to move through the energy body and out into the world. It is not that one becomes a more powerful ego, but that one has allowed to drop away from the self many things which were either blocking or dimming the light which moves through each entity within creation. As entities become more spiritually mature, they become more and more aware that they do not know anything. They become more and more aware that they are living in the now and that this now is a beautiful, magical, wonderful moment wherein two worlds meet. The world of phenomenal experience and the world of infinity and eternity. They become aware of themselves as a place where these two worlds may express at the same time. They are embodied spirits and may feel both the day and the night, the heat and the cold of all of the dynamics of opposites that create the world of male and female, the earth world. At the same time, they are able to feel the energies of infinity and eternity move through them and create that consciousness which only time space and timelessness can offer. Gradually, an entity becomes aware of himself as one who plays in the waters of time, much as an otter plays in the pool, leaping and jumping for the very joy of movement, rejoicing and enjoying water and the sunshine and all that occurs in the rhythmic cycles of play. It is not that one takes oneself less seriously in terms of being willing to spend the life dedicating the self to the infinite creator and to service to others, but rather it is that the burden of being a serious seeker falls away before the very organic and natural light-hearted and merry vision of oneself and awareness of oneself as a creature of the one infinite creator, not striving but being. The feeling becomes almost one of curiosity. Ah, I am in this present moment. Creator, where shall you toss me now? What is your will for me this day? We would at this time pause to ask the group if there are follow-ups to the central question before we take other questions from you. We are known to you as Hatan and we now pause. I have a follow-up question. Is Don Juan Matus, the teacher of writer Carlos Castaneda, real? Can you talk about him as an entity and a shaman? We are those of Quo and are aware of your query, my brother. Because this question is part of your active process at this time, we find that we would be influencing you unduly were we to commit directly. We can, however, offer some thoughts connected with this query having to do with spiritual principles if that would be acceptable to you, my brother. Yes, gladly. We are those of Quo and therefore are able to proceed in some way. We apologize that our desire to maintain our polarity causes us to refrain from more specific information. One spiritual principle involved with your query which may be helpful to you is that of truth being untouched by its vehicle. That is, the question of whether one such as Don Juan Matus or Jesus the Christ or Zarathustra was real is irrelevant to spiritual seekers. Each thought that has been thought by an entity in creation has a reality. It has a vibrational nature. Depending upon the intensity of that thought, its life may be tenuous or powerful. And if a group of entities are working with the construct of a Don Juan Matus or a Jesus the Christ or a Zarathustra, then the thought forms connected with this entity build up and have a life of their own with their vibrational characteristics depending upon the strength of those who come to form themselves by thinking along the lines suggested by one of these great teachers. 
Another spiritual principle that is sometimes helpful when gazing at the writings of those inspired entities which have written is polarity. When an entity who is teaching is purely positive in polarity, there is within the teaching a flow of wisdom and compassion which does not have to do in any way with control over others. The magical systems of many of your cultures, including the so-called sects of the Christian religion, sometimes contain mixed polarity and that there is the attempt, either by the leader of a sect or a type of thought, or by the organization that rises up around a leader or a professor of a certain system of thought, which is helpful of controlling and manipulating entities or situations. The positive polarity has no axe to grind but exists in an energy of faith, love, gratitude, and joy. Often wonderful teachings that are very positive in polarity are intermixed with teachings that have strongly moved into the energies of yellow ray, where there is the ability to work in groups. And instead of sinking into the group and allowing the group to express its worship and its practices, on a spontaneous and radiant basis. There is the negative yellow ray concern for the manipulation and disposition of its members or of situations having to do with entities with whom it is in relationship. We will encourage the one known as A and all of those who read concerning very helpful and interesting ideas such as the one known as Don Juan Matus offers in his system of teaching to again, as we said at the beginning of this session, maintain the most thoughtful discrimination so that you slow down the process of absorption of new material to the pace where you can absorb it in a considered and comfortable manner. There's often a tendency towards impulsivity when one is surrounding oneself with the thoughts of a new source of inspiration. This impulsivity does not serve the seeker nearly as well as the attitude of being one who reflects and then lets go, and then reflects again and then lets go so that one gradually deepens one's intelligence concerning a particular system of thought. There are always pearls that are just for you, but there is almost always surrounding material that acts more as a fertilizer than as jewel. So there is that process when working with inspired material of slowing that self down who is so eager for the fruits of this system to the pace that enables the seeker truly and genuinely to absorb material in a way that does not rush the fences of intellect and toss one into a situation where one is simply beginning to repeat by rote various things that a particular entity has suggested to be true. We move to a channeling delivered on July 12, 1992. The question this afternoon deals with the concept of change and transformation and the confusion, the anger, the frustration that comes when we don't feel that we are changing in the way that we wish to change. Most students of their own evolution look at their lives and at some time attempt to match the life with the ideals that they hold and feel that there are, are certain things that they can do. But most of us look at our attempts to change and feel that we are inadequate in our change and that we are perhaps not even moving in the right direction. And as we begin to change and have this confusion and anger, we become further befuddled when we don't move as we wish. It seems to be a self-perpetuating cycle and we're wondering if there's a way that we can make the process of change one more easily accomplished or is there some necessity for change in order for it to be seated in our being to become a tumultuous sort of experience are we supposed to be in turmoil is there some benefits that we can gain from being in turmoil is there some way to deal with the turmoil that is erroneous can we communicate with our higher selves through dreams can we do exercises can we watch our diet can we meditate more what can we do that will make our perception of our change more balanced and harmonious? How can we accomplish change in the most efficient manner as seekers of truth? We are those of Quo and greetings and blessings to each in the love and the light of the one infinite creator. We wish you the peace of heart and mind that seekers have, yet often know not that they have and would offer our thoughts in reaction to your query upon the ways of dealing with confusion when the changes in life feel as though they were coming too quickly to understand or guide. As we offer our thoughts, we remind each that our opinions are fallible, and if any thought disturbs any of you or feels misplaced, simply to omit it from your memory, as we would not offer even more confusion of an unhelpful kind. We imply that change can be helpful, confusion can be helpful, and do so on purpose. There is a difference between discomfort and injury, 
The confusion of incarnate life in general is massive and was meant to be so in order to challenge and successfully baffle the intellectual mind which thinks in black and white yes and no. The point of this baffling effect is to coax the seeker into opening the heart to the processes of thinking, evaluating, and decision-making. Those with unawakened hearts may reason perfectly yet come to inappropriate or inefficient decisions and conclusions relative to their own deeper desires. The spiritual journey is many things, but is not linear or logical. Earlier this day, this instrument was thinking of a story within its holy work. It is an apt tale to share at this time. It concerns a traveler who was robbed, beaten, and left upon the road. He was passed by a very well-placed gentleman who had an appointment. The man left the traveler on the road, as did another wealthy man. But there was a stranger who found the man, and although he was not from this particular region, the stranger took up the robbed and beaten man, carried him to a place of safety and succor, and made sure the beaten traveler had what he needed to recover. In the context of the Holy Bible story, this was an answer to a question concerning who one's neighbor is. The answer indicated that all were neighbors, not simply those clustered geographically around one. In the context of the query concerning confusion in a time of change, the story may be seen to be an inward representation of a frequent circumstance which occurs when the seeker attempts to monitor, review, analyze, and interrupt the process of change in order to make it more like the picture the seeker has in the mind. When a seeker becomes an actor, not only of desire but of grasping the life as it is being lived and attempting to help the process of change along, the seeker is standing athwart what may loosely be called desire-driven destiny. The resulting cross tides of confusion are a mechanically created artifact of this stance. Yet each seeker wishes to so live the life and so cleanly make each choice that it is in charge of the life experience and gives it up to the infinite. One is a beautiful gift. Of course, seekers wish to help along the process of transformation, but if the seeker can pull the point of view back far enough to gaze upon the conscious self living through the confusion of change which has been put in motion because of purified desire, the seeker may see that once the desire is honed and tempered, then there comes the time of faithful patience. The intellectual mind may rush ahead and seem to predict accurately outcomes which are not actual outcomes, thus creating confusion on top of the necessary initial confusion which accompanies any change. How much better to respect the work in consciousness which has been done and then to see the self as the first neighbor, the nearest one to the observing portion of the self. The conscious seeker moving through the frustration, pain, and anger of not yet understood changes is a weary, broken, tired, and needy traveler. Yet there is a portion of the self which may remember to forget the rush towards in the next appointment to let go of the control of happenstance because there is a neighbor, a self, which happens to be the self rather than another, which needs aid and comfort in his travail. The seeker is so eager to go through the process of transformation, yet it is a long, subtle process, the implications of any one decision seeming on the surface limited but when one is transforming the being the seemingly limited ripples of effect give way to a much more complex field of interwoven options or verities of tone and color in the may we call it sub programs within the mind which are in fact affected by seemingly simple changes in the way of being to change an action is relatively simple in its effect upon the essential core meta programs of beingness it often does not touch any deep program to, to change a behavior. You are asking about changing a beingness, changing the way of perceiving and experiencing one's own essence, and this is endlessly subtle work. You can and may well take the uncomfortable self and visualize the giving of healing and love to this self. You would do just such for another. You also may do this for the self. When the self is somewhat comforted, the gaze again may be turned to the observation and watching of the working out of the destiny requested by the purified desire already spent. Faithfully and trustingly place the deeper observational self with eyes clear and alert at the right hand of all that occurs. 
but ask for the patience and the faith to remain an observer while a process seems to be all working itself out. All your work as an entity of spirit is groundwork laid in before confusion overtakes one. Once the cloud of confusion is there, the realization simply may be maintained and remembered that this was asked for, this is occurring, and this is a time-bound phenomenon. In this way, you are able to affirm your own desires, to comfort your own discomfort, and to position the heart open and lovingly addressing the confusion in tones of faith in the process and trust in the kindly nature of the Creator, which allowed you as co-creator to create this vortex of transformation and to go through it, powered by desire. You ask, what can be done to aid the process of change, to ameliorate the discomfort of the confusion? First, we do not recommend attempts to become comfortable. If change is comfortable, it is likely not to be effectual. One wishing change is dealing with power which is moving in one direction. This power and all its ramifications are being asked to alter their vectors. In any study of movement of things with weight, one can see clearly the mechanics of turning to be those of the braking, the balancing, the changes in the steering, and so forth. A good deal of dynamic work is done when there is momentum to overcome and a new direction to be taken and then to be accelerated in a new direction. So too when doing work in consciousness. You have a certain amount of spiritual mass which has a certain amount of momentum. When change is desired, prayed and asked for, visualized and preparations made, then there is a very graceful moment available when the realization may come out that the spiritual visualization preceding change has been completed. And now the spirit along with the conscious self in incarnation must hang on for a bumpy ride, for there will be the breaking to overcome momentum the proper shift in direction which takes several adjustments, and then the process of gradual addition of power to the direction so that the pace is accelerated once again. The one who attempts to rest change too quickly is doing work against the self and subverting his own spiritual, purified desires. The various helps mentioned as possibilities such as working with dreams, changes in diet, and so forth are valuable individually insofar as they offer a seeker comfort. What is most uncomfortable about confusion? It is the disorder. It is the feeling that one is out of control. Those who seek to tend to see this feeling which is natural and say, I should not be feeling off balanced, I should be clear. But should is not a helpful word. The way one should be is the way one is. We do not mean to split hairs, but to take one word out of the language would be perhaps rewarding to those moving through change and the word is should. The heart has a wisdom concerning time which the mind lacks. Thusly, it is well to let the heart choose what form of comfort it may appropriately and skillfully take to bolster the endurance while going through transformation. Such things as the cleansing of the diet may well give one a feeling of more control. The keeping of the dream notebook is a way of glimpsing the material which the deeper mind is discovering recovering and restructuring, and this may give one a deeper sense of some control in understanding the process. But intrinsic to the process are two things, the willingness to endure through discomfort and the faith that invokes unlimited patience for the time of change is, in spiritual terms, timeless. Yet that instant which in time-space exists for so long, being fully potentiated to come into manifestation in space-time, occupies a variable amount of space-time in the experience of one in incarnation. Thusly, there is not a standard waiting period and patience needs to be given without limit. One thing we do recommend for all who experience confusion is a very well-encouraged sense of humor. The most helpful point of view for a changing spiritual seeker is light-hearted irreverence. Play with that which is occurring. Be playful. Allow the vision to relax the eyesight to become less than entirely single-mindedly keen when the pressure mounts and the anxiety builds when a frustration and anger begin to accumulate. Lighten your own load with laughter, and if you can laugh with another, the strength of this joy is doubled. Part of the service spiritual seekers may be to each other is to exhort and encourage each other to take it easier with the situation and the self. Many are the times when a serious seeker feels very inadequate to that which he wishes to accomplish. The earnestness begins to become more tight and urgent. 
The seriousness is taken further and further into the beau guest, consumes one. To a point, this intensity is helpful. Beyond that point, it always needs to be remembered that the most serious things in a life experience are made more clear and understandable by the enhancement of turning the spotlight off the seriousness of the situation and onto the beauty, the praiseworthy beauty of the overall plan. When one may praise the plan and give thanks for going through the necessary confusion, one is then taking very seriously and single-mindedly the transformation itself, but has let up the pressure on the self to do such and such or not do such and such in conjunction with this transformation. To take the principles, the ideal, seriously is excellent. To take the self seriously is folly. Let the self be human. Laugh at this humanity. Love it and see that it is perfectly normal to fear that which is painful. In this group, there is not the holding of the fear to the self for which we would need to request correction. There is only the judgment of the self by the self as the self sees that it has fear. May we say that, in our opinion, fear is a normal and healthy reaction to pain. When you were small, you recoiled from the touch to the oven. That was wise. Now you put yourself to more subtle testing of the boundaries and nature of your journey. You will frequently touch something very hot and have the healthy fear which allows you to recoil and remove the self from spiritual or mental pain. Allow yourself to move naturally and vulnerably through the unknown. Accept and love the fear, the frustration, the anger. Note them. Honor them. Comfort the self-experiencing them, but do not deny them their appropriateness. Why should you not feel the difficult process happening? Why should the changes not cause many bumps, stops, and starts, and discomforts which express themselves in manifestations of fear, anger, and frustration? When the unknown has been penetrated by desire, the new country cannot even be seen. A transforming individual is mapping for the first time the new and changing territory of its road. The way is mazed and mottled, and in many ways the sensing self is blinded by so much incoming data concerning a novel situation. The computer mind of the physical body gives many, many alarms when receiving this kind of data from the meta-program. The resulting fear, anger, or frustration is completely understandable and acceptable, at least to us. We hope we have enabled you to have compassion upon yourselves. You have asked a question which can only be asked by those who are consciously working within themselves and who have accomplished to have a purified the desire and begun to co-create a life in faith. We speak to experienced wayfarers and we say to you, when did you expect to be perfect, comfortable or settled if you wish to be a pilgrim on this particular road to infinity? You know well, you expected none of these things. Comfort yourself, therefore, through the frustration. Love yourself through the anger. And cherish yourself through the depression and the grieving at the loss of the old familiar ways. Above all, release the spirit pilgrim from the strictures of perceived time and know with every fiber of the being that the Creator's time will become your time at the absolute moment of manifestation of transformation. Watch, wait, pray, praise, and give thanks. Always give thanks, and this thanks and praise will inform to a great degree the attitude that must lighten up the load of negative emotion. We cheer you on in your desires, and we are sympathetic with the painfulness of transformation, but we realize you wish to know not only comfortable words, but uncomfortable ones, if we feel them to be true. We do feel that it is just to experience negative emotions in an illusion which seems chaotic. We exhort you to lean on praise and thanksgiving and then filled with this buoyancy of spirit, gaze again and again with compassion on the weary, weary traveler that is your outer conscious self. We apologize for taking this much time with this query, but we felt that there was no quicker way to express what are a fairly complex and subtle series of points which attempt to ground you in a new way of perceiving the spirit itself in transformation. We would at this time thank this instrument and transfer from it the one known as Jim may conclude the session. We leave this instrument in love and light. We are those of Quo. 
Question. When one is cycling in the negativity, understanding that there may be a judgment of self occurring, a lot of times that manifests in the physical. One can feel it through tension headaches or through difficulty with stomach or intestines. It will affect you in the body in some manner. There's concern as to whether that negativity that is festering, obviously it's turning into internal damage in the physical body. How do you define the difference between healthy negativism and negativism that actually goes deeper and in effect ends up being destructive to that self who, in essence, is only trying to heal the self? It seems to be a paradox. Are there ways in which you can either attempt through that period of negativity when you don't seem to be able to get to your higher self and understand the higher concepts? Is there some other way or other method that you can work towards healing the physical aspect of what you're feeling and what you're doing to yourself in terms of being able to block that from happening so you don't further self-destruct with the negative patterns while you are attempting to heal yourself of being negative? I am cool and am aware of your query, my sister. The overriding concept in our opinion as regards this query is the feeling that is at the heart of the entity as it is attempting to move itself into a new pattern of being, perceiving and doing. There is that fear of not living up to the ideals that is a kind of angst, which we have suggested may be utilized by the seeker in a manner which will have the overall effect of enhancing the transformation. This is that small quivering fear that remains at the corner of the mind reminding one that there is the need to give the best effort at each moment, the kind of fear we find to be not deleterious in the usual sense, but that which spurs the entity on to its best effort. The kind of negativity that takes center place upon the inner stages of being and thinking and tends to cause a gathering about it of further fear is the fear which begins to rot, shall we say, various connected points within the mind-body-spirit complex. And eventually causes physical degeneration of those organs connected to the emotional bodies as you've been studying them. This kind of fear is that which is indulged in by those who have either little rain upon their inner doubt or who have a tendency from time to time to indulge in self-destructive, as you would call them, behaviors and thoughts tempting the good intentions of the entity itself so that the entity becomes divided within itself as to how it shall expend its energies attempting for a good portion of time to affect those positive changes in which it has invested its ideals and its concept of self, and at the same time seeking to undermine those ideals and the effort to match the life pattern with them. This darker side of fear is that kind of fear which has given a certain sort of pleasure to the entity in its previous experiences, a kind of punishment of the self which the entity has seen as necessary according to those experiences, with the parental and other authority figures within the early life experience so that the entity does then when there is the challenge that presents itself in the form of transformation and change is to behave in a split fashion so that one portion of the self exhorts the self to move to those high ideals and the other portion of the self for a variety of potential reasons assumes the punishing parental figure and punishes the self with the kind of fear that not only undermines the desire and effect of the change but also can cause the physical disease as well. For this kind of fear and other behavior or thought that moves one into the areas of disharmony and imbalance, we recommend the daily meditation and use of balancing exercises, which each in this group has utilized for some portion of time in the past. This looking at the inventory of mental and emotional experiences for each day can find the roots of such fear and remove them by balancing them with their polar opposite in the manner which those of Ra gave as the balancing exercises. We recommended the daily review in the meditative state of all the thoughts and behaviors that have passed through one's being. As the water moves through the river channel, so that disharmonies may be detected as early as possible and balanced in a manner which makes more whole the entire range of experience of the seeker. Question. I think I understand what you're saying. And the split I will understand. The only other question I have, I guess, are fears that I seem to have in confusion in reference to being able to identify them. I will certainly attempt to do so during my meditations. The only other concern I have is, are some of these fears so deep-rooted that I may not be able to consciously find them in my day-to-day -day experience? Are they things that will come up in the future as I do these practices? Or are there certain fears that are innate and part of the incarnational experience that will eventually cause this continued split? Is there a way to mend the split in this particular incarnation 
or is this going to be a part of the learning lesson that I must experience? And are some of the negatives that I seem to be experiencing, are they old negatives that I seem to be harboring? Or are they just a continued perpetuation of a lot of little things that seem to add up and turn into a pattern that seem to coagulate into this big, huge pattern that then seems to self-perpetuate itself? I am Quo, and I am aware of your query, my sister. Within each entity, there are fears, not because there is the necessity for fear to be a fundamental portion of this illusion or any incarnation, but because that which is mysterious, hidden within the depths of the self unknown, and which has obvious effects upon the conscious seeker, is that which poses the potential threat. The seeker, which moves upon the journey of illumination and which moves into the depths of the self, is well advised to look at the overall perspective of each incarnation and the creation as a whole, as that which is made of love. Any deviation from that love is, in some form, a distortion of love which may be discovered by the persistent application of daily meditation and the review of the experiences of each day's round of activities. There is no fear buried so deeply that the love-inspired seeker of truth cannot uncover and balance this fear with love. We do not mean to seem to be naive in this regard for our recommendation in many instances where seekers feel confusion and fear is to focus upon the fundamental quality of love. We continue to recommend this focusing upon love as the foundation stone of all creation and all incarnation, not only because this is so as we have experienced it, but because it is well for each seeker to look for that love within the life pattern in order that the desire to see and seek this love may perform its part in attracting this love to the seeker. For it is a metaphysical principle that you shall find which you seek. We recommend, therefore, that as you plumb those depths of mystery within that, you remind yourself that you move within a creation of love, a creation which is in harmony with itself and with you. These fears that motivate from the depths of one's being have power only because they are distortions of the power of love. When you are able to untangle the distortions of love, then you shall see how this distortion was first caused. The cause is almost always within the early portion of this life experience in accordance with choices that were made before this life experience regarding that which one wished to learn. Is there a further query at this time? I have an observation and a query. Being the channel, I couldn't really catch everything, but it seems to me that in describing the way you go about getting through transformation, it's a lot like the way you go about channeling, and that all the work that a channel does is done before the channeling ever begins, and it has to do with cleansing the self of human opinions and world opinion and just the junk of everyday thinking, and trying to tune oneself to the highest and best in one, but then also to ask for the highest and best that one can carry in a stable manner. When you were talking about change, it seemed to me you were saying that the work that you do is done before change really begins. It's when you desire to change something about yourself and the desire purified to the point where it actually starts a change occurring. And at that point, your work is over and what you need to do is in the midst of your desire to say that you want to approximate your ideals, the highest and best that you're capable of and the change that you're capable of in a stable manner. Is that just an observation or is that valid? I am Quo, and I'm aware of your query, my sister. And we can agree wholeheartedly that you have made a point that is quite valid, for each seeker of truth is a channel for the life experience. And when one finds oneself in the midst of change or transformation, this experience is the result of much desire previous to the beginning of the change. For first must come the recognition of oneself as one is at a particular moment. Then there comes, or perhaps does not come, the desire for change in a certain area of the life experience. Only after these recognitions have been achieved is the seeker able to undertake any portion of the change, which then may be manifest to the eye, the ear, or the emotions of the seeker undergoing the change. By the time the changing and the frustration that comes with change is noticed, most of the work of the seeker has been accomplished as regards setting the change in motion. The work that remains for such a seeker noticing the change within its being and experience is the work of moving in harmony with the change. For this reason, we recommended the light-hearted approach which tends to be that all is well, that discomfort can be humorous and certainly can be survived, and can be survived most effectively when there is the light-hearted approach. Is there any further query? My sister? No quote. Thank you very much. 
I'm Quo, and again, we thank you, my sister, and as we appear to have exhausted the queries for this session of working, we shall take this opportunity to thank each seeker present for inviting our presence into your meditation and circle of working this day. We are very happy to be invited and privileged to partake in your seeking. We offer our words and opinions freely, with the only admonition being that you take those which ring of truth to you and leave behind those that do not. Again, our great gratitude for your desire to seek and for your invitation to us that we might seek with you. Wait, before you can go, can I ask another question? I am cool and we are happy to entertain another query from the one known as D. Okay, great. We were discussing earlier about tones and things that we receive here and I guess we became more aware, at least in my own experience, I become more aware of certain things that would not seem to be the norm for most people. The discordant tones that I heard in one particular instance, which were all very loud and buzzing in my ears, I want to know why that occurred. What was happening when that occurred? What happens on other occasions when just one single tone occurs? Does this have something to do with discord always, or are there other various reasons for these particular things? And the other thing that I've been lately experiencing, which was the freeze frames of patterns which I see which have only happened in the last couple of months, is that just one awareness happening? They're interesting when they happen. They seem to crop up more and more as I become more aware and as I was wondering if you could define these and if there are reasons for the discordant tones, is there any way that I could work with them when they do occur so that I can either rebalance myself when it occurs or is there another reason that it occurs? I am Quo and I'm aware of your query, my sister. To begin, we must speak carefully in these queries for we do not wish to infringe upon your free will discovery of the symbols which your subconscious mind provides to your conscious mind as a means of focusing the attention. Those tones which sound disharmony are often utilized to signify just this. Look at that experience which was most important and which preceded such tones in your previous experience and correlate those experiences with these tones as the number of tones of disharmony increase. Look at the symbol of increased disharmony. The query concerning the freeze frames is one which we must be most careful with for this means of communication from the subconscious mind is one which is more specific in its indications of the need for attention. Look at the frames, meditate upon the images, make the correlations which appear within your inner view as you meditate upon the images. Just in reference to the freeze frames, right now at this time they appear to be so fast I can't grasp them perhaps because it is just meant to be an attention getter, seeing as my attention is not always there in meditation. Should I focus on attempting to draw them out so I can recognize those as patterns, or is it just occurring because my attention span is not where it should be when I'm meditating? It's not just when I'm meditating, though. It happens all the time now. So when I close my eyes, and whether I eat or go into prayer or just attempt to close my eyes for a few minutes, they occur, and they occur quite frequently. So I take some kind of signal that I should be doing something, but I can't seem to grasp it. And I can't seem to grasp the patterns because they are so instantaneous. They're almost quicker than a second. And I'm just not sure what to do or how I should take these frames and meditate upon them when I can see them and catch them. I am Quo and I'm aware of your query, my sister. To meditate upon that which moves quickly before the inner eye is perhaps to move into a different kind of meditation. That is to say that the images move quickly rather than attempting to stop the movement and capture an image it would be helpful to feel the feeling tone that such rapid moving images leave as their residue. Perhaps an image will remain with a feeling tone, perhaps just a feeling, perhaps just an image, perhaps a series of images, whatever is the residue, the charge, the power of the experience, then take that residue and meditate upon it and make whatever correlations present themselves. In this way, we feel that you may begin to follow a trail, shall we say, which is being left for you by your subconscious mind, which has been alerted by the conscious mind through your intensity and desire of seeking. That information is desired in regards to a certain kind of level of seeking. This trail is that which is of importance. Follow the trail to the best of your abilities, realizing that the methods used are those which you are the most susceptible or most able to glean information from. The only other query I had was in reference to the dreams. You had mentioned earlier that we were a series of complex illusions of dreams within dreams in reference to the framework of information between myself and my higher self. How can I go about deciphering what seems to be nonsensical dreams? I find patterns that I begin to recognize. Carla has been a great help in reference to helping me to decipher some of these. But is there a better way? 
Is there some kind of thing? Seeing as I have a tendency to work in the dream field, it's very natural to concentrate on something before I go to sleep so that I may be able to attain the highest clarity of connection between myself and my higher self so that I can begin to work in conjunction with meditation and prayer. When I do this, there's a method of visualization or something that I can do just prior to sleeping while just on the verge of going to sleep so that I can mentally attune myself to receive the highest or best work for either that particular day or the particular situation that I'm in that I need help. I am Quo and I'm aware of your query, my sister. We feel that you have well prepared yourself for the work with dreams and can only suggest that you provide yourself with the tools for recording your dreams as soon as you have experienced the dream as is possible. The repeating and reminding to the self that you wish to remember the dreams is most important and the preparation for the dreaming by mental contemplation upon the topic of most concern is also recommended so that the brain will have access to as much information as possible to feed into the dreaming process. This is helpful as a preparation at all times. Is there another query, my sister? Yes. I've experienced in the past hearing telepathic messages through my dreams from what seems to be various different entities when I've asked certain questions. One of the reasons I've refrained from doing this for the last year was the caution involved. But there were times when I telepathically received things. Was that coming from my higher self? Was that coming from a guides? And should I continue to attempt to work with those who have obviously worked with me in the past through dreams? Or should I really, within the next year, continue as I've been doing, working directly with the higher self and from the higher self into God? I am cool and I'm aware of your query, my sister. We must apologize for being unwilling to give advice in this regard, for it is in the area that is of most importance in the exercise of your own choice-making ability to determine those practices which are more helpful than are others in your seeking. And thus, we leave these choices to you, reminding you that you are aware that your higher self portion does indeed communicate with you in your dream state. Is there another query, my sister? No, but thank you very much for all the information. I am Quo, and we would ask if there are any final queries at this time. I am Quo, and once again we shall thank each entity for the honor of spending time and opinion and inspiration with you. We are inspired by you as much as we hope that you are inspired by us. For you seek within the illusion of the third density, where so much of the Creator must be sought in the darkness and mystery. Brave and courageous souls are you who so seek. We leave this instrument and this group in the love and the light of the one infinite Creator, encouraging each to seek the Creator in all things and to set the mind upon love. For that is that which is the truth. We are known to you as those of Quo, Adonai, Adonai Vasu, Boragas. There's a lot to unpack here, a very powerful description and explanation of the processes of transformation. What is happening to us on this planet right now is we are moving very much like the caterpillar to the butterfly. We're moving from that process of walking into flying. And it's a beautiful process that involves what Quo calls a catalyst. And as they explain in these channelings, it's going to be uncomfortable. And if it's easy, then that means you're not really transforming is what they're indicating. They recommend having a sense of humor about it. You're going to go through some crazy things that are going to be frustrating and fearful and to have a light heart, to know that everything's going to be okay. That's the root of this teaching But as they indicate, transformation is a cycle. It is an inevitable cycle. You will transform. You shall become a new creature. The only question is whether or not you wish to accelerate the process of your own spiritual evolution. And you can speed up the process. As they say, those that are listening to these words, just your desire and wish to transform and evolve will hasten the rate of speed of change in your life. Just by wishing to be transformed and be willing to be transformed, You make the space for being transformed. They also discuss the rhythm of transformation, being linked to several things. It could be related to what you chose prior to your incarnation. It can be related to when you're born. There's a natural time for each part of the experience of your incarnation to flourish and to make way for different experiences. They indicate that You're accessing deep and subtle energies, such as stars in the sky, the sun, the moon, 
all of this is a part of cyclical transformations that are occurring in your life. The fourth density energy that is intermingling with us now is increasing the level of transformation. We talk about shifting all the time. We're going through shifts, the coming shift, the great shift, the great awakening. But it's subtle. It's happening on a regular basis, increasing a little bit every day. Every time you listen to an episode, I promise you, you've been transformed more and more. Each relationship which you have gives you a mirror for yourself. Your dreams tell you about what's happening in your life. The world around you is showing you the transformation that's happening within you. And they're natural, and it's a part of entering into fourth density. The fundamental transformation of a human being within incarnation is from that spiritual childhood of just feeling being tossed about in random chaos and then that realization of love and that mature spiritual awareness in which you take responsibility of the world around you and you realize that it's happening because of what's happening within you. And if you want to maximize the opportunity for transformation, you can decide to hone and focus your efforts and focus on this transformation and you can make it happen. There's so many other wonderful things that they talk about, but you imagine your transformation as a spiral. So you end up in the same place, but just higher, continuing in a spiral-like effect. I genuinely enjoyed the question about Don Juan Matus. Was he real? And of course, they were never going to answer, but they indicated it doesn't matter that many of the spiritual figures that we talk about, it doesn't matter if they're real or not, Christ or Zarathustra. It's the information that they have. And the only thing they recommend and when you're accessing these different teachings is to slow down and take it a little bit at a time. You can overwhelm yourself with new teachings, which I'm guilty about. I felt like Quo was talking to me when they said that because I want to learn as quickly as possible. But they gave you a way of evaluating information that you're getting. And if the information that you're getting is talking about manipulating other people, then it may be coming from a negative polarity. And I've even caught myself doing it. I even have episodes in the podcast we've explored where if you think you're talking about influencing other people, even if we go to the episode on getting a text from someone, I tried to emphasize that you want to make it natural. And if they don't want to, that's fine. And you want to get a text from the best person possible. There may be an argument made that you're manipulating on some level. So you can evaluate the information that you're getting in terms of its polarity by how it talks about manipulating others. I just found that to be fascinating. Love to know what your favorite parts of these channelings are. And if you're going through that process of transformation, how can I help you? I'm imagining you transforming into just an amazing spiritual butterfly, something amazing with the light of love powering you into something amazing and wonderful. I can see it. I'm sending light and love to all the people listening. I'm so excited to speak with you and share these words and share your journey with you on this journey of transformation. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.